Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. We will uh, get started, although people might still be coming in. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar on the Corona Y Knowledge Graph. And this is a webinar organized by uh, the Freya Project, who has invited um, uh, Slava Tikhonov from Co the Corona Y uh, initiative to talk about the knowledge graph that they've uh, been developing. Uh, my name is Ricarda Brauchmann. I work for the Freya Project and also at Dance. And I will um, give you an introduction to the webinar and then give the floor to my colleague Slava, who will talk about uh, Corona uh, or Corona Y initiative. So just before we get started, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, you might be already familiar with the rules of uh, webinars nowadays. So we will uh, we are recording this webinar and we will make this available together with the slides afterwards uh, on Zenodo and on YouTube so that you can um, uh, rewatch it and also have the slides available to you. Uh, we would ask everybody to stay muted during the presentations and also to keep your uh, video off. And you can always unmute yourselves if you have questions. Um, and you can also use the chat to ask questions. We will monitor this during the presentations and there will be room for uh, questions in the Q&A session. If you have technical issues, you can let us know through the chat and we will try to help you as best as we can. So um, this is an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. First, I will give you a, a little bit of an introduction to the Freya project who is, uh, who is organizing this uh, webinar today. And then I will give the floor to my colleague Slava Tikhonov, who will talk about the Corona Y knowledge graph uh, for most part of this webinar. And then at the end, we have time for the Q&A uh, session. So um, just to give you a bit of background about the Freya project, I don't know if uh, everybody's familiar with this project, but we are in a European uh, project that is working on persistent identifiers. And as I mentioned already, my name is Ricarda Brauchmann and I work as um, the work package lead for the engagement and communication work in this project. So the Freya project in a nutshell is a project that um, concerns itself with the building and extending of the infrastructure for persistent identifiers or PIDs and particularly uh, within the European Open Science Cloud. So we are in uh, an EU project that started already in 2017 in December, and we are ending this year. So this is uh, uh, this is sort of the, the end of the project. And we have a lot of uh, nice outcomes that we would like to share also related to uh, uh, pit graphs and knowledge graphs. So this is uh, why we are also really curious to hear about the Corona Y initiative. So as you know, persistent identifiers um, uh, can be used to uh, describe uh, digital objects and provide a persistent, unique and actionable reference to these objects. And as such, PS PIDs are an essential um, part of the FAIR infrastructure and also of open science. And the FAIR project is concerned with the development of the infrastructure uh, within the European Open Science Cloud. So Freya has a couple of aims. So we are, have been working to improve a discovery and access of research information. And we've done this through uh, developing new types of PIDs, but also to extend the infrastructure around existing uh, persistent identifiers. And we've also been working on different disciplinary PID systems um, with a couple of disciplinary partners. So you can see all the partners involved in the Freya project here below. And um, as such, together we uh, work on integrating these services around persistent identifiers into the context of the European Open Science Cloud. So Freya itself consists of three um, core pillars, the PID graph, which is concerned with the, the sort of um, services, the PID services that we are de developing in the project, and in particular, the PID graph itself, which I will talk about in a minute as well. And then we have the PIT Commons, which is concerned with the sustainability of the systems and also um, consolidating the services and making sure that they remain available um, for the long run. And then we have the PIT Forum, which is more concerned with um, the community aspects and um, the sort of iterative engagement that we do um, make use of to develop the services that we have. So these are the, the sort of core pillars. And I want to talk a little bit about the PIT forum and the PIT graph before uh, giving the word to my colleague uh, Slava, who will talk about uh, Corona Y. So the PIT forum uh, is um, 
something we have established in the Freya project, and it is a global discussion platform that um, concerns anything and everything related to PIDs. Um, so it was initiated by the Freya project, and we launched it in 2019 at Pedapalooza. We now have about uh, 450 members, but it's uh, it's still growing, and we would really welcome everybody who is interested in uh, pits or knowledge graphs to join the forum and join the discussions that are on there. Oh, we have a lot of different threads. Um, it's a discourse-run um, forum uh, where there's a lot of discussions about different topics and you can share your knowledge and, and experiences and also promote events that are related to PIDs. And we also have a knowledge hub section where we have a lot of information about PIDs and also training materials about persistent identifiers. And then the, the other pillar of uh, Freya that is particularly relevant to the webinar we're having today is the PID graph. And uh, the PID graph is really about connecting uh, different PID systems and providing information about the resources that the PIDs um, identify and about their connections. And you have a lot of different use cases that you can answer with such a, such a graph that I'm sure Slava will talk about a little bit in his presentation as well. And I just put a couple of links in this uh, presentation that you can uh, look up because we will say, share the slides afterwards um, to give you an idea of what we have been doing in Freya. So we have a, a nice video that explains in a bit more detail uh, what the PID graph, PID graph is and what you can do with it. And in Freya, we make use of data sites GraphQL API um, where you can sort of query the, the graph that we've been developing. And just recently, we had a webinar about the use cases, um, so different use cases on how you can use the PID graph and the connections between persistent identifiers to answer specific research questions. And we have developed a couple of Jupyter notebooks as well that uh, you can look at um, uh, if you are interested in this. So this is just briefly to give you an idea about the Freya project. And if there are any questions, you can put them in the chat and I will uh, try and answer them. Uh, or if somebody has a, a direct question now, that is also fine. And if not, I would give the floor to my colleague Slava, who can hopefully share his slides. Okay, <clears throat> okay Ricardo, can, can you uh, put me in, in presenter mode? Yes. Now you should thank be able you very much to... for a nice introduction. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can see it now. So, first of yeah. all, a bit about me. So, I'm senior information scientist at Dance, uh, and uh, Dance is an institution from Netherlands. And I was involved in uh, more than ten projects uh, after joining Dance in 2016, and mostly those projects they're research infrastructures and. Uh, I used to work on, on Dutch research infrastructures and also on European research infrastructures funded by Horizon 2020 programs. And uh, here you can see, you can get some impression uh, for, about projects I used to work on. And uh, uh, when actually everything started with uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, so I started to, uh, to, to watch for trends uh, already in, in January. And uh, when it came from China to uh, Europe, I created a data hub to collect COVID-19 data from Europe. And it was quite a difficult situation uh, because nobody actually shared data in a fair way. And uh, it was not possible to find any official uh, statistics even. And uh, this is why I started to approach different groups and I started to advise them how to collect data and how to share data. And I published uh, those data uh, in Harvard Dataverse. So, yeah, this is motivation that I actually published on uh, Coronavirus Slack. So, uh, after working in so many projects, I saw a lot of situations that people uh, actually refused to collaborate together. And it was really clear that collaboration should be a kind of key to solve COVID-19 problem, uh, not only like, like on social level and medicine level, but also uh, in collaborative level uh, using research infrastructures. So I decided to join uh, some initiatives and also to help people and facilitate all this collaboration uh, on technical uh, level. And uh, uh, yeah, here you can get some impression uh, 
what actually I brought to Kanawai. And uh, I've spent also, it's quite interesting story. So I spent uh, seven weeks in, in complete lockdown uh, in Spain, in my apartments. And uh, it, uh, it was not even possible to go outside because Spain had uh, really strict rules uh, in March and April on people going outside. So um, in that time, uh, it was already clear that the situation is going to be really uh, difficult for the whole world. And in Spain, uh, they uh, started to think how actually to entertain people, how to support people. And uh, Spanish musicians uh, created uh, this nice song uh, and they did it completely remotely using Zoom or GoToMeeting software. And uh, it's called Resistere, I will resist. And uh, also we will share slides, so you, you, you can also watch this cl uh, clip and uh, understand uh, this song. And I thought, well, why not to apply the same principles and just to not, not to try to build the same kind of collaboration where people can, can just work remotely and uh, just uh, share their knowledge and to get the same goal and just to share the same results, uh, to, to share to get some some results shared and uh, this is the way how actually this corona crisis can can be uh, how people can fight against this corona crisis so i decided to join corona y in the beginning of uh, april 2020 and at that time uh, they had like like 300 volunteers and now we have more than 100 300 uh, 1,300 uh, people registered and uh, it's really amazing community because we have so many people just bringing uh, their knowledge and skills and their solutions and people just, just can use uh, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, modern technologies uh, to get some, some knowledge uh, combined and uh, this is a way how how they see uh, this corona crisis can be uh, how it's possible to find again against corona crisis and do something together so it's all started from a uh, court 19 uh, uh, collection uh, challenge and uh, it was published on, on kaggle in march 2020 and uh, it contains covid 19 open research uh, data set with all papers on, on coronavirus and uh, a lot of institutions got involved in this and uh, first it was of course Allen uh, uh, Institute for Artificial Intelligence and after big companies uh, corporation joined like Microsoft and Google and it was supported by uh, White House so uh, it was our basis uh, ba basic data set that we started to uh, process and to, to try to get some some kind of meaning out of it and so uh, this is a very interesting chart. Uh, it's about motivation of other people joining the uh, Coronavac community. And here you can see in top three words, help, data, and world. And uh, it actually means that people just came to help to uh, medical community to solve uh, and to find some information about COVID-19 and, and uh, to respond on, on uh, COVID-19 research questions. But also you can see there are like skills and learning. So uh, people are also coming to learn something new and uh, probably to get uh, acquire new skills using modern technologies. So this community is basically, uh, it's very modern and uh, this is probably the model how uh, every research project in the future will, will do kind of uh, innovative collaboration between people from different parts of the world. So a little bit about funding. So first we've got uh, $5,000 US dollars from Google and $4,000 from Amazon. And uh, after other companies and organizations started to donate something. And here you can see, uh, for example, NASA GPL. And uh, uh, we've got a Slack subscription for free and trailer and uh, from other companies. And uh, it's very important that in uh, basically in, in, Ju in July, uh, we've got also some money, uh, 9,000 uh, US dollars and 15,000 uh, British pounds, actually to sustain a coronavirus infrastructure. So in March and April, we had uh, the, basically these uh, five tasks. And uh, of course, uh, the most uh, important uh, just to how, how to we, we, we uh, structured them. So first task uh, was about task list. And uh, it's about uh, 
identification of risk factors uh, that can increase a chance to be uh, infected. Second task was called uh, Task Ties, uh, and it was dedicated for explore, uh, transmission exploration and incubation and uh, environment stability, and uh, as a task uh, to match clinical trials from uh, international clinical trials data set. And uh, this is just, just a task that we are working on uh, very actively. It, it's about COVID building COVID-19 uh, literature visualization to, tool. It's using uh, artificial intelligence technologies. And to do that, uh, we started to work on, on a common name identity recognition and natural language processing pipeline to do processing of complete COVID-19 uh, collection. Of course, after we got uh, COVID-19, uh, it was not clear what, what actually we have. So it was one of first data sets uh, that uh, got processed with uh, deep learning. So uh, people from coronavirus community actually managed to, to uh, use these technologies to recognize uh, all locations uh, and uh, also institution affiliation data. And they published everything uh, and shared with other people from, from community. And our visualization expert, Mike Hani from Australia, he managed to build this nice map visualization. So here you can see almost 200,000 uh, 200, affiliations uh, visualized on a world map. And uh, if you'll click on the link, it's interactive. So you can actually select any country and to see what kind of institutions used to work on, on COVID-19 uh, research questions. Also, we've got really nice collaborations with other parties. And uh, so people started to uh, come to this coronavirus community because they got curious what's going on and uh, what actually we are doing with artificial intelligence. And uh, so we have really nice collaboration with Harvard Medical School and people just uh, working on Indra integration. And I will tell uh, in further slides what Indra is. Also, we have people from Stanford University, from NASA, uh, and uh, we managed to integrate the GeoParser, for example, developed by NASA in our infrastructure. And also, we, uh, we've got a COVID-19 knowledge graph from NASA to do further integration. Also, we are collaborating with Kaggle. We created Chronomet application uh, to get all our research questions linked to publications uh, with the help of artificial intelligence. And Fraunhofer Institute also provided their knowledge graph for our people just to do something, some investigation uh, and to find some, some interesting links. Also Decipher, and uh, this is platform for creating engaging and uh, with distillations uh, of articles. Uh, they came to us and we are helping to uh, create uh, infrastructure for them and uh, to train models. And uh, another partner is uh, Cameradis and uh, they're busy also uh, this, uh, helping uh, researchers to, to find um, relevant publications for COVID-19 questions. So um, we, we also have a lot of other contacts and uh, discussions. So basically we've got uh, almost endless data streams coming from different parties and uh, different people doing something with COVID-19 research. So uh, it was clear that uh, we need to find, uh, we need for, to, to look up for some uh, common model, how to actually to integrate all these data together. So uh, there is very nice Harvard Data Commons model and we decided, okay, let, let's try it uh, to see if it works for our case. And in this model, we have research tools and data repository connected to research tools and also some computing resources and storage layer. So basically all these components are connected together and uh, you can see uh, like common tasks about collection cleaning process is uh, they're done by, by uh, researchers, but in the same time we have data management platform, uh, Harvard Dataverse, and uh, this is where we are storing all metadata and uh, data itself and provenance and uh, keeping all versions and uh, do some other things. So um, yeah, this is chart actually uh, showing uh, what we want to get. So we are running a lot of vertical teams at Coronavai and also we are waiting other people to join this initiative and to work together. So basically we want to create horizontal platform to serve, to, to serve uh, vertical teams with, with any research questions. So it means that uh, we are kind of creating um, common tools and these tools can be shared with all people from 
all teams. And uh, if they will create something that can be reused for other teams, uh, or they will produce data sets that can be used. So we are just sharing everything with uh, other collaborators and uh, we're using uh, machine learning and uh, modern technologies, natural language processing uh, pipelines that can be reused uh, for all partners. So the most important, of course, uh, is not uh, is not about uh, sh uh, sharing uh, something that is not fair. So turning something fair, uh, findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and uh, reusable is one of our goal. Um, one uh, one of our, our uh, important goals. And uh, my institution, Dansk in NAV, is one of uh, worldwide leaders in fair sphere. In, in fair data, so we are running fair sphere project, and basically we have all uh, skills and all expertise uh, how to actually to turn data into fair principle uh, using fair principles and publish and share and uh, provide those data uh, for uh, collaborative efforts like Karanawai. Of course, uh, we are standing on shoulders of giants and already mentioned uh, projects that I used to work for, and this is an ongoing project. It's called Shock. And in this project, we're responsible uh, for building a data uh, repository platform uh, based on data, Harvard Dataverse. And I'm leading this task, and my team is working hard just, just to get uh, this data repository for four different communities uh, in Europe. So basically, uh, when uh, it was clear that a data platform is missing at Karnavai, so I immediately deployed uh, our latest uh, development of uh, Dataverse on Kubernetes. And this is how people started to share data that uh, they already collected at Karanawai. And another project that inspired me uh, to join this uh, collaboration uh, is Time Machine Europe. And this is a very impressive project and uh, very ambitious. And the idea that uh, 4,000 years of European history uh, will be digitized and uh, all historical documents, paintings, and monuments will be available in, uh, on data portals. And um, after the idea to build largest computer simulation with virtual reality tools, just to get inside of uh, those times and to see how it is what it looks like, uh, it was looking like a like, uh, thousand years ago. So uh, this project also uh, was based on, on open access and uh, basically uh, it's exactly the same direction as, as we try to follow at Karanawai, it's open science, reproducible science. And uh, this is a project from where I've got ideas how to build this international collaboration without actually interfering and uh, interfering the ideas um, of other people. So, uh, like I already said, Dataverse is our integration point. So, it's available uh, from April as a service for all community members. And uh, most of people just using Dataverse to upload their data sets and share with uh, other collaborators. And uh, we've got quite a lot of uh, files already. So, uh, it's more than 700,000. And the reason for that, because after people started to upload something, they immediately started to ask questions, can we find some, some data on specific topics? So at some point we added, um, uh, we developed a harvester that actually does exactly the same as Google does, but by uh, specific keywords. So it's harvesting information from web. And for example, it's scrolling data from GitHub and just creating data set and uh, some extracting some metadata and creating data set with metadata descriptions in Dataverse. And for every file that we will find, uh, we're actually extracting uh, variables. So I will show you in the next slide how it looks like. So this is just just example of data set that uh, one of vertical teams uh, deposit. And here you can see uh, uh, they also uh, put all authors. So it's quite a long list of people that used to work on this data set. And this data set also can be used in, in other research, uh, uh, not only uh, like, like risk factors, but, but uh, other people from doing some different research can, can use this data set and can uh, create citations and uh, do some interesting things. So uh, I already told you about uh, how we are harvesting uh, web. 
to find some COVID-19 related data. So this example, uh, we took file verification. So if we'll find some interesting data that related to coronavirus, we're trying to get uh, all uh, files in, into data frame. And if uh, this operation is successful, we'll just enrich uh, all metadata with uh, variables stored in columns. So actually, it allows uh, to get uh, some some kind of understanding uh, of uh, what is inside of data set without even download. So you can just scroll through all files and you can see if there are some some interesting data that you can use for your research. And if yes, you can just uh, con connect con um, directly to Dataverse and get this uh, file in uh, data frame. So this is example and uh, basically um, it's possible just to use Jupyter notebook and uh, in this example we're just connected to uh, Dataverse and uh, we selected some, some uh, GUI and also file uh, ID that is visible on uh, in Dataverse interface and um, it just creates a uh, pandas data frame with all data inside of uh, Jupyter. So people can just easily access all data and uh, they can do something with it. So after we've got so much data sets, of course, uh, metadata was non, um, mostly missing and we started to approach uh, people just asking them, people uh, who actually uh, we are original owners and uh, data collectors. And this, they started to ask them if they're interested to curate and uh, update those data sets on their own. So uh, surprisingly, more than 20% of uh, data owners, uh, they agreed to join Coronavai and uh, they got account. And this is how they can now manage their own metadata and uh, to increase uh, fairness of their own data sets. <coughs> Sorry. So basically it means that bottom-up data collection really works. And this is what I can advise to other uh, initiatives uh, to reuse this kind of concept. So clearly there is a challenge of data integration and uh, um, yeah, because uh, our pipeline is quite, quite uh, complicated. So we have like manual annotation and labeling of COVID-19 uh, related papers and also automatic uh, entity extraction and classification of text fragments. We have statements instruction uh, with Indra and also some curation tools. And uh, the most important task, how to link papers to specific research questions with keeping all the relationship. So it's quite complicated because we also have uh, various data with various, various uh, variables and data basically coming from different disciplines like medical data and uh, social economic data and political data, various statistics. So it's quite difficult to get uh, everything in, in like common space and to create common uh, knowledge graph. So this is where, where uh, the importance of standards and uh, ontologies uh, is very, very critical for projects like uh, CoronaVai. And of course, uh, we are relying on con uh, generic control vocabularies and uh, we want to link all metadata and bibliographic collections to famous ontologies like Orchid, Breed, GeoNames, Getty, whatever. So it, it should be just as universal uh, or uh, any kind of ontology. And because we have medical questions, uh, of course, uh, we, sh we should use medical subject headings, MESH. And this is essential because, for example, SkySpace uh, module uh, just getting back only MESH entities. And also another component is uh, biological uh, expression language is very important and Wikidata. And everything should be based on uh, bi bibliographic standards like Martin P1, Dublin Core and uh, DDI. So uh, some uh, some uh, things we started to deploy as services already. For example, biological expression language uh, you can just get uh, out of uh, our infrastructure. It's very easy to just to get it installed in your place and to play around and to see how you can describe biological expressions. And it started in in April 2020, and now it's widely used by uh, Cranway people. Also, another tool uh, is, is called Indra, and it was developed by Harvard Medical School. And this is a very interesting tool. It allows to extract statements about COVID-19, and uh, those statements can be can 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 be also linked to knowledge graph. And uh, <clears throat> it it 
can allow actually to understand uh, what is written in research papers and uh, has uh, very good potential actually in uh, navigation uh, and uh, data exploration uh, um, in, in the building of navigation tools and data exploration models. So I really advise you to uh, check this and it's called Emma, this dashboard and you, you can just get a lot of information from this. Also, because uh, of course, in, in uh, COVID-19 papers, there are a lot of statements that probably uh, well can be correct, can be, can be incorrect. So uh, Indra has a nice web interface uh, where it's possible to do creation and uh, for medical experts, it's quite, quite easy just to get registered and uh, to confirm on or decline some, some statements. So this is nice functionality. And of course, because we are using a generic pipeline, so it kind of makes no sense without domain specific ontologies. So in this example, you can see all, all words and uh, all uh, relations, but just to get uh, understanding uh, where we need to analyze context and we need to link every entity to some ontology. So what we do actually, we started to do processing of uh, data stored in Dataverse. And this is example, uh, for example, uh, data from Italy about COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, we're just trying to get all these data sets uh, linked in RDF. And uh, actually this example, uh, it's quite clear because uh, we just need all data sets from uh, about COVID-19 to get linked in the same way. And this is how it looks like. It's pretty simple. So you have uh, all relations and uh, all uh, basically every circle uh, means uh, day. So this is also from Italy and this is official statistics. And because it's in Italian, we, we should immediately link it to, to some common ontology just to get uh, also understanding what, in English uh, what is about and uh, what kind of information this knowledge graph has. And uh, we deployed GraphDB DB database also. So there's possibility just to uh, get all these uh, visualizations out of the system very easily. Also for professional users, they are running uh, Sparkle endpoints. And this example, how people can query. Um, our knowledge graph is just using Sparkle queries. And however, it can be uh, quite difficult. So this example that uh, people uh, like, like using in real life, and this is what we want to get, how to, people can, can just use Sparkle uh, to answer this kind of uh, research questions. So it's difficult to imagine that people can, can do this, especially medical experts, uh, they can do this quickly and uh, without preparation. So of course they can use some tools uh, for Sparkle, for preparation of Sparkle queries, but still uh, it's quite complicated. So now I'm coming to another project and uh, well, I used to work on this project for quite some time and uh, it's called Claria and uh, I want to share some clear conclusions uh, because they also face it exactly the same problem. And despite they used to work on different topic, it's uh, arts and humanities. They observed that users without semantic web knowledge uh, think that Sparkle and semantic web technologies are hard to use, and they place uh, high value in end users uh, and user tools. So, uh, well, it's basically chicken egg problem because users are building tools without any data models and uh, ontologies, but probably want to get uh, all their data uh, in, in a knowledge graph. But in the same time, to build a proper knowledge graph, they should uh, choose uh, for common ontologies uh, like, like in the first place. So it's quite a difficult project, uh, problem and uh, we tried to find solution and of course there is worldwide web consortium uh, that busy with exactly the same problems and uh, this slide is about link data integration challenges because we have a lot of data and uh, multilingual data from uh, different countries also and uh, data quality is uh, usually quality control is usually lacking who knows uh, what they published as trusted data source and data provider, providers also using different modeling schemas and styles. And of course, link data cleansing versioning is quite difficult because if you're talking about web resources, 
uh, actually the nature of web resources is not persistent and this is why we need to use uh, DOIs or another persistent identifiers and um, while it's quite difficult problem also with data repositories because usually they are providing uh, access only on metadata records level not directly giving access to individual data items stored in in, uh, in files and uh, it's very difficult to uh, keep all uh, relationships between uh, entities in knowledge graph so there are a lot of things that uh, not clear how to do and um, yeah we started to look for kind of solution and let's see what we found so um i started to experiment with uh, bibliographic framework called bibframe and it was developed by library of congress and officially it was launched in, in may 2011 quite some time ago and basically according to definition it should do exactly the same thing so it's about how to get common place for all data uh, produced by different partners and different disciplines so the idea that instead of thousands of catalogers repeatedly describing the same resource it can be just one cataloger that can share uh, all these findings with uh, many people so in in 2019 they uh, updated uh, this uh, big frame uh, framework uh, this second version and uh, they announced uh, extension of uh, concepts so let's see what we have now uh, big frame two concepts actually including work instance item agents and subjects and as you can see uh, this model is quite suitable for our purposes because it's not domain specific but it's coming from a uh, bibliographic point of view and for example uh, like things like uh, mentioned in work like authors languages and uh, what is about this work subjects can be directly mapped to this uh, big frame uh, framework and also uh, you can see some some interesting things like events and subjects uh, also highly related to our data that we have and also agents so uh, i really advise you to take a look in big frame because it seems to be very interesting for uh, integration of any kind of data sets so uh, just to go a little bit uh, inside of uh, bibliographic business, uh, BibFrame uh, was developed as kind of replacement of Mark, and Mark was developed a long time ago. It stands uh, for machine readable uh, cataloging, and it was developed by uh, Library of Congress, and uh, they extended Mark with uh, new entities and also with languages uh, for international community, and they called it Mark 21 and that's something that we are also going to use in our case and after it became iso standard which is also nice so how to, to integrate data in the common space uh, first of all uh, we should think about uh, authority records that uh, basically means uh, like uh, authors uh, geographical names and uh, other things so basically authority records uh, from bibliographic business uh, corresponding to uh, control vocabularies and ontologies from semantic web uh, uh, community and all control vocabularies should be expressed in mark 21 format and after we, we need to build authority linking process with human in loop approach uh, and it should allow to verify all artificial intelligence predicted links by human because uh, we obviously need to control quality on every step so also a different mark 21 fields could be linked to, to different ontologies and just to give you an example uh, mesh medical uh, subjects from uh, national health institutes of united states is proprietary ontology and if we want to do a kind of uh, proper analysis we also need uh, to link to wikidata entities so be generated automatically and uh, we can keep all relations and link all control vocabularies together and we can just create bibliographic record that contains all this information 
Okay, so <clears throat> this is example of how it looks like in uh, Mark 21 representation. So here you can see uh, this is the title and uh, some information about affiliation and uh, uh, also about locations. And uh, everything, because this, this format is highly structured, everything is stored in, in their fields corresponding to some uh, concepts. And uh, for example, in the 650 fields, you can see uh, mesh entities that got extracted by our uh, natural language pipeline. So basically it's artificial intelligence that created, partly created this uh, bibliographic record. And uh, it's possible also to keep all provenance information in specific fields that can indicate if uh, this record uh, was created partly by a uh, machine or it was confirmed by human. And of course, we can keep all relations in, in uh, like 630 fields of this uh, Mark 21 uh, standard. So uh, to make it more uh, interesting and uh, more uh, practical for medical experts, uh, we started to look for uh, solutions. And uh, there is famous uh, library system called uh, Viewfind. And basically, it allows just to input something that uh, was exposed in, in Mark 21 standard. and uh, it can provide this nice web interface that allows to browse through all um, information that uh, we've got inside. So basically there are some, some filters already available and uh, uh, search functionality and uh, a lot of other interesting things. So also it's possible to give annotations to some data. So uh, this tool is very useful for medical experts and uh, reminds PubMed, but only partly created by a uh, human, partly by machine. So this is how landing page uh, of uh, publication, COVID-19 publication looks like. You can see, uh, of course, there is a field about authors, about the affiliations, and uh, basically what, what you saw just in Mark 21 record is shown here and uh, you can also uh, scroll down and you can see all uh, entities extracted from from mesh uh, belonging to this specific uh, COVID-19 publication. Also, uh, this is uh, basically COVID-19 collection uh, reflection in BibFrame 2. So here you can see how it looks like. We, we managed to, to get all these uh, authority linking processes done and uh, here you can see there is a geographic uh, ontology also uh, mesh inside and uh, this file is just stored in, in uh, our dataverse so you can download complete uh, coordinating collection in, in rdf and you can query it and there are some some examples how to do that so uh, because because we're just following open science principles everything is just public free and uh, we're waiting for collaborators actually to work on this also with us. So like I already said, it's difficult to uh, rely on on, uh, on, on human, uh, on, on a machine for all cases. So obviously we need human in a loop approach. And now I will cite Albert Einstein. And he said that computers are incredibly, incredibly fast, accurate and stupid, humans are incredibly slow, inaccurate and brilliant. Together, they are powerful beyond imagination. So our goal actually is to create combination of artificial intelligence and human intelligence, and uh, we need to get kind of super intelligence. And uh, this is quite interesting solution of this uh, problem because we can get uh, artificial intelligence to support humanity uh, in, in like a common task for classification and. Uh, labeling and uh, supporting people with relevant inf information. So in order to do that, uh, I will go back to uh, Claria and uh, there is a, a network digital uh, heritage um, project. So they, uh, they're working on a GraphQL endpoint and we also deployed this endpoint on our Kubernetes cluster. And uh, actually we are able to connect uh, our, uh, our system to any kind of ontologies that's stored in Sparkle. So there is uh, like a like, uh, common interface that it's possible just to change configuration of this tool and you can query it in, in nice uh, GraphQL interface and also to get back all uh, entities. And if you want to try, there is an example. So you will get back all entities. 
and it gives us opportunity to extend other systems from our infrastructure with control vocabulary support. So, for example, for uh, Dataverse, uh, this work was done by my team for a shock project. And uh, what we do actually, we extended uh, standard Dataverse repository with external control vocabulary support. And we, we just directly uh, connected uh, this uh, deposit form to uh, GraphQL. And we're using like middleware mappings. We're able just to extend uh, uh, this uh, support with any kind of uh, ontology also. So it can be not only uh, Sparkle, but something that can, can come from SQL API endpoints. We are also able to integrate in this solution. And also, it gives up us opportunity uh, actually to uh, to integrate with other systems, this kind of common approach. So it's very important that people uh, can, can give uh, feedback and they can create annotations about what we actually uh, extracted automatically. So we are also running another tool called Hypothesis and uh, this is plugin that can actually be installed on any browser. And using this plugin, medical experts can, can go to uh, COVID-19 publication, uh, select some, some fragments of text and provide some, some information uh, about statements. And this information will be uh, also integrated in our infrastructure and uh, we are able to run uh, the same uh, natural language processing pipelines and to get uh, some entities and also to enrich knowledge graph that we are building. Another tool that's supporting uh, natural language processing tasks is called Takana. It was developed in Japan. And basically this is a very convenient tool because it, will, it allows to uh, verify results uh, that we've got with uh, artificial intelligence. So in this example, uh, there is a fragment of text and uh, it's already coming from uh, after NLP pipeline. And if something is wrong, people just, just can, can just select some words or some sequence of words and they can put another labels and all this information will be available as JSON. So we can also train uh, and retrain model and we can use this information to refine system and produce better model, models in the future. So basically we are building an uh, open uh, operating system for open science where everything should be oblig uh, open and public. And it's distributed because we are using uh, Kubernetes and it's in the same time it's highly scalable because you can deploy it on any cloud and uh, also it, this infrastructure can be reused for other important challenges, uh, not only for COVID-19, but for example, for cancer research or something else. So this infrastructure is, is built completely from open source components and all data processed and published in fair way with use of uh, data lake that we built on top of Dataverse. And uh, we also have um, annotation tools in our infrastructure to give a credibility uh, of results that we are getting for medical community. And um, it's uh, quite transparent and everybody can just join and bring their own uh, tools if they think they can, can help to a uh, community and can be reused for common tasks. So if you, uh, yeah, if you're interested, there is a link to a GitHub repository. You can just get it uh, installed automatically uh, in your place, even locally. Uh, there is Docker Compose and also Kubernetes uh, infrastructure behind. So there is a list also of uh, other services like Elasticsearch and MongoDB and other things. And uh, like I already showed, they have Virtuos and GraphDB um, support. So we have a lot of interesting things that can be used by other institutions and basically it's out of the box. It's available for everybody. And uh, to make it more uh, sustainable and uh, uh, to increase interoperability, we started also to uh, work on, on the common data API and it's built on a fast API framework uh, for Python. And basically every kind of uh, data set or every uh, new system can, can be integrated in this data API and you can just query and get some back, uh, something back, like information about uh, latest COVID-19 cases or whatever you're looking for. Yeah, so I think I'm, yeah, I'm open for questions now, so.
Yes, thank you, Slava. So uh, we welcome participants now to uh, either post questions in the chat or you also you can also unmute yourself and uh, ask a question in that way. Okay, I see a uh, first question from Victor. Hi, Victor. So, yeah, prob probably you can just turn on uh, your microphone and just to ask. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yes, okay. So, uh, thanks for the really nice talk. So, um, apart from the uh, Mark 21 classes that you... Okay, so the, the knowledge graph... Um, has entities of many different classes. And you mentioned uh, what has to do with Mark 21 and its successor that uh, are yeah. these, uh, yeah, uh, bibliographical stuff. But you, and you also have these um, mesh concepts or mesh uh, headings. What other classes do you have in the knowledge graph? Oh yeah, so, so um, yeah, I already told you about affiliation. So we have grid integration and uh, we started also to uh, link uh, entities to ORCID. And uh, well, now it's still in development, but uh, it looks promising uh, and it seems we, we can just get any kind of classes integrated and ontologies uh, by using uh, like common solution with uh, BitFrame 2.0, yeah. Thanks. So it's not really domain specific. We can get any kind of uh, data inside. Okay. And and uh, individual paragraphs in the court data set are they assigned? Are they entities by themselves or uh, the smallest okay, level so, of text in mm -hmm. the document? Okay. So um, well, for individual paragraphs, we also have um, uh, and uh, entities because uh, basically we're using SkySpace and. Uh, I think it's producing automatically all this uh, stuff. And uh, what what I forgot to mention, uh, we also uh, can integrate research questions as a, as a authority records in this uh, Mark 21 standard. So it means that if we know uh, that some papers belonging to these research questions, we can just put in like in bibliographic record all links, and it will became findable in uh, in the knowledge graph. I hope it's clear for you. <laughs> yes, thanks. Okay. Okay, another question from Mark, Antoine. Can you probably also turn on microphone and... Uh... Of course. I think yeah. you might just have answered my second question, actually. Uh, but the first one, uh, we started with Freya and PIDs, and uh, you did... I may have missed it, but I don't remember you mentioning uh, Freya as a data source. Are you... Is there a connection? But but Freya is just using the same uh, the same ontology, so it's ORCID okay. and uh, yeah, so it's just universal basically. I see. But about so, so you're the, using the same underlying ontologies. Yes, okay. yes, it's, it's just the same. It's uh, it's not possible to invent something new. They're just standing on like like a, already set on shoulders of uh, giants in this case. Hey. And when something is a frequent phrase comes up that is not grounded in an ontology, I, I did hear you say they would be added to the system. Would they be added? Is there a way to flag them for adding in the ontologies? Yeah, so it will be added to, to the system. And this is why we have a few annotation tools that actually allow to uh, change this and uh, to uh, actually uh, to refine uh, this knowledge graph and remove some some statements, for example, that not, not corresponding to reality. Right. And uh, just uh, answering your question in the chat, so Indra has uh, own identifiers for every statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically it has potential also to become, every statement has, has potential to become uh, authority record in, in uh, uh, this Mark 21 ontology. Okay. And, uh, this is where we can link all papers to uh, those statements as well. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm, other questions?
So I don't see any other questions at the moment, but we can just wait a little bit to see if anybody still has some questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand uh, if if my presentation was <laughs> clear enough or <laughs> still. I think it was it was a lot of information, but we will share the slides also afterwards in case people still have questions or want to reread okay. something, then people can also get in touch with us, of course. Um, and uh, okay. in the chat, it says very impressive work and presentation. Thank you. And I think I can only agree um, that this was really nice that you were uh, able to talk to us today, Slava. And if there are no more questions, then I would like to thank you and thank everybody who has attended the webinar. As I said, we will uh, we will share the, the slides so you can um, have a look at all the links that Slava provided. And you can also get in touch with uh, with us if you have more if you have more questions afterwards. So uh, yeah, I would say thank you to everybody and close the webinar now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.